Everyone knew The Wizard of Oz would live or die on its performances, and one role towered above the others. Even though to us it seems obvious there's no one else we could think of in this part, it's a slam dunk, back then Shirley Temple was the bigger star, she was the one who could open a movie, she meant box office. In 1938, the number one box office star in the world was a cute ten-year-old who, despite her youth, knew a thing or two about lobbying for a role. I have lots of fun in Bermuda with the horse and buggy, but I'm glad to be back in New York, because after all, there's no place like home. Then, as now, Hollywood movie studios were owned by corporations 3,000 miles away in New York. If the executives of Lowe's Incorporated, which controlled MGM, were going to green light a multi-million dollar fantasy film, they wanted an insurance policy in the form of Shirley Temple. But Arthur Freed had someone else in mind. Freed is really responsible for the casting of Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz, who, on the surface, doesn't look like the sort of person you want leading your big-budget MGM movie. She wasn't a big star. She wasn't tall or elegant. She wasn't even conventionally beautiful. In fact, Louis B. Mayer, who had her under contract since the age of 13, referred to her as his little hunchback. She's small, you wouldn't really say beautiful, and she conveys a real nervous energy. Now, these are not Fred Astaire's qualities. The Wizard of Oz was at a crossroads. If the executives in New York had their way, Shirley Temple would star in the film, which might have doomed it to the dustbin of movie history. But Arthur Freed had one more card to play. He sent his right-hand man, Roger Edens, across town to hear Temple sing live. Roger went to Fox, and he came back and said, what can I tell you, Arthur? Her vocal limitations are insurmountable. Freed insisted that Judy Garland be the one to play Dorothy Gale in The Wizard of Oz, and he really, really fought for her. He gave her a chance, and she ran with it and became a superstar. And yet that role couldn't be more different from who she really was. It's the antithesis of who she was. She was not a farm girl from Kansas. She wasn't wide-eyed and innocent. She had a rather miserable upbringing in show business, in the hardened world of show business. How old were you when you got your first job? 30 months. What was it? <laughs> I was singing. My mother was truly a stage mother, a, a mean one. She was very jealous because she had absolutely no talent. Now she's going to knock my ear over. <laughs> my mother was, you know, my mother died. And she, whenever I talk about her, and I should because she was so wicked, but whenever I start to talk about her, she inevitably knocks one earring off. So she's still around, so now, mother, you behave yourself. If living with an overbearing stage mother wasn't enough, when Garland surveyed her classmates being groomed for stardom at the MGM school, she saw such beauties as Lana Turner. The experience fueled an insecurity that would plague Garland all her life. Judy Garland really would have understood what it was like to open that door into the technicolor weirdness of Oz, as she herself, a young girl of 16, and even younger when she came to MGM, was raised in a kind of Oz. MGM was like nowhere else on earth. She was far away from home. She was picked at by flying monkeys in her own way. So Judy could draw from deep wells of personal understanding on the set of this movie.